Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm your host, Todd Nesloni, the Director of Culture and Strategic Leadership at TEPSA. And each episode, I look to bring you a different guest who has encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another and bring them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to share some of yours. I am so excited for today's guest, Ernest Krim, on with me. Ernest, tell everybody kind of who you are. Hey, thanks for having me, Ty, first and foremost. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. My name is Mr. Ernest Krim III, and I go by your favorite Black history teacher. I'm a speaker, <laughs> Black history advocate, and of course, I'm also an educator, newly published author, and my purpose, and thank you, thank you, <laughs> my purpose and my vision is just to be able to use the past to prepare our students for a better future because I think there are so many important lessons in the past and I just believe in my heart that it has not been taught correctly and I think a lot of our kids have been disillusioned with the uh, romantic, romanticizing over American uh, history. So I, I try to give them truth and with the purpose of letting them know that things weren't as rosy as we believe they were <laughs> so that we yeah. can, you know, of course, prepare for a better life moving forward. Well, Ernest, I am so excited about today's conversation because I just, I love the work that you're doing. And I think it is so vital and important, especially in the day and age that we live in today with all the stuff that we have going on. But before we jump into that, I just want to start with, you know, your own background growing up, what did you want to be? And, and, and was it always what you are now? Like, did you always have that vision of, nope, I knew this from a little kid that I was going to be doing this. That's a great question. You know what's funny? Um, I think I was like most boys. The first thing I wanted to be was a Power Ranger. <laughs> uh, I to okay, be I can totally connect. Look, I gotta show you right there. You see, you see the Green oh, yeah, Ranger. Okay, right? I see it. No, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be a Power Ranger, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Eventually, I matured. Uh, I wanted to be a basketball player in the NBA because I grew up in Chicago in the middle of the Jordan hysteria. Shout out to the Last Dance uh -huh. on ESPN. <laughs> um, and and what, what's funny to me was I, I had a, a pivotal moment in my life when I was nine years old. And it wasn't that I was searching for a career, but it was that my mom spoke something into my life. And I was nine. And I remember just going home from school that particular day. We had been talking about presidents. And this is probably 96 or 97. So we're in the midst of Bill Clinton's presidency. And I asked my mom straight up, why is it that we've never had a black president? Right. And my mom, you know, didn't really seem to be taken back that much by the question because she immediately retorted uh, because they're waiting on you to grow up. And from, <laughs> yeah, so that was pretty cool. So for most of my childhood, I had this duality of like wanting to be the star athlete. And of course, also knowing in the back of my mind that education was vastly and just very important. But I, I never thought I'd be a teacher because my mom was an educator. My dad went to work every day at his company for, you know, 30 years. So in my mind, I, I wasn't going to be doing what they were going to be doing. It just so happened that I came across this career when I was in college and I just, um, you know, almost flunked out of school and at U of I and I took a black history course and immediately fell in love. And I, I'm just like, yo, if my, my people in my neighborhood knew about this, if I knew this when I was younger, you know, life would be completely different. It's almost like you just found out a secret and, uh -huh. and it's something that can just help people immensely. And you're just like, yo, do you all know this secret is right here? <laughs> like this is the winning lottery ticket. So, but of course, like most kids, it was athlete, superhero, you know, yeah. shout out to Batman, Spider-Man, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, well you know, Ernest, I, I just, I could so connect with everything, so much, so much of what you just said right then. Um, but, you know, I, I love that you advertise that you are a black history advocate. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't shy away from those words, that you mm -hmm. don't shy away from that conversation. And, and I know that you just expressed that, you know, when you took that class, it really opened your eyes to the reality. And so w was that the pivotal moment that you thought more than just this opening my eyes, I want to be a voice to open others? Is that Was that class kind of where that happened? Yeah, it, it, it really became a thing for me where and this was around the time when Facebook first started and it was something that only college students could get on. So you had to have a dot edu. So I was yeah. the guy I would learn something in class that day and I would, you know, have to you have to go home. I didn't have it on my phone yet. So you get on your <laughs> laptop and I'm typing a status about the stuff I learned. Like, did you all know this? Did you know that? And to me, it was I, I've been around the same time we have uh, racist incidents on campus. So it's almost like these things were lining up and I'm like, oh man, this is really connecting now. I, I understand why it's so important, but 
I never I never thought that it would uh, that would be someone who was an advocate of it. Even when I was in high school, I didn't really it wasn't my top interest. I loved math. That was my thing. I was a math kid. Um, I did. I always did great in history classes just because I'm like, you know, I'm just answering the questions at the end of the chapter. How hard can that be? But it just became something for me where I realized that the, a lot of the success that I was having in my life was because my parents enforced a positive mindset for me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize how important it was until I um, had different incidents in my life where I, my, my, my self image was, was, was being challenged. Like when I was pulled over with my friends in high school for no reason and the officers flat out told us we fit the profile. And then when I'm in college and you, you deal with somebody calling you out your name, calling you the N word when they're driving past, you begin to reflect and say, yeah, these incidents are, are a bruise. They are a wound, they are a cut. But the, the reason I was able to heal was because my parents had a bookshelf full of these individuals in the back like Malcolm X and they had posters all around. And I didn't realize how rare that was until um, I entered the world of academia and began studying for my you know, bachelor's and master's degree. Well, you know, something that you express there is something that, you know, I think we don't talk about enough. And that is just the amount of microaggressions that that you, for example, have to go through. And, you know, I think of myself and, and being a white male who is middle class in this country and the amount of opportunity that's afforded to me, but also the the things that I don't think about that I take for granted that you are that my own bias and white fragility and and those kind of ways and I've tried to really broaden my own horizons there's so many things like just the one example you shared there about being pulled over by a police officer and you know I've talked to some of my uh, my black friends and they've said you know we were trained as kids here is how you talk and here's what you do and don't say when an officer pulls you over and I thought God, I, my parents never said that. They were like, if an officer pulls you over, you must have done something bad. So you're going to have to deal with that. And so, you know, when you're working with kids now and this and it's so personal to you and, and what you go through. But then we see things on the news like what's happening now with with so many different uh, things. How do you still speak hope into our kids when this injustice is so prevalent still today? Yeah, that's oh, that's an excellent question, Todd. Um, for me, it has everything to do with what I do as being a Black History advocate. I'm constantly searching for examples. I'm constantly looking to I'm looking for proof because I know there's proof because I I've began I've begun to start uh, before slavery. You know, I started in Africa. I, I show people what we did before we were interrupted. Um, I show kids that there were black there were black millionaires in the midst of slavery. Of course, in the North, there's a guy named Paul Cuff who, uh, you know, was born a free man in the North and made millions of dollars working on a dock. And he, he opened up his own school to educate black kids. And, and, you, and you show people these examples. To me, it's always like, look, if they could do that during that time, what's stopping <laughs> me? And I also, you know, it's like, I mean, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, all these amazing people. And for me, I tried my best to also exude hope by, you know, when I, I've dealt with the hate crime before, by just showing persistence because I'm showing people firsthand that having this knowledge about myself allows me to persevere. Um, and I'm also aware, too, that our kids with social media, unlike when I was growing up, and I'm sure unlike when you were growing up, you're exposed to these images all the time because they're always on your phone. It's not just turn on the TV or look at the uh, newspaper. It's as soon as you go on Facebook, you'll see a video or Twitter, you'll see a, uh, see a video. So I think it's even more important now that we we reverse the effects of that negative programming and brainwashing and show our kids an overabundance of, of positive uh, images of themselves doing great things. Because again, if you watch a movie and you see what um, Dr. King or Malcolm X or um, uh, Rosa Parks or Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, what they went through, again, what we're going through is still challenging, but we, we can persevere and we can do it. Well, you know, my question then lies in the fact that, you know, you are doing so much great work in this area and really speaking up about this, you know, I know that you you have times where you get pushed back, where people will say hateful things to you or or things like that. How do you not allow the opinions of others to to stop you from from what your message is? Like to me, I, w- I would feel like you would be bombarded with so much so often that it could easily 
just wear you down where you're like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm done talking about this. But you know, when something's that important to your heart, you keep going. So what keeps you going? Yeah, it's, it's, it's that itch you get, you know, it's, it's, it's not just like I'm getting hurt on the football field or basketball court. And it's like, oh, well, I guess I got to hang this up. My body's not there. This is something I feel like I've been, well, I know I've been called to do. And again, I think it has everything to do with my mom speaking life into me at that age and my dad giving me these words of wisdom and demanding excellence with my academics. When he picked me up from school, asked me about my grades. So <laughs> that's why it's, it's so important for our kids like to get this foundation of confidence from their parents early on. They always talk about how the first five years are so important for kids. Um, you know, talking to them, reading to them, exposing them to, to an immense vocabulary, a wide array of words. But it's even more important to show them positive images of themselves because it's a cruel world, not just for me, but for, for a lot of people. A lot of people are dealing with different things. So um, by the time I, I dealt with a racist incidents, I just had such a, a such a foundation of that of, of hope that I couldn't really be deterred. Now, I will say it's not that it doesn't hurt. It, it does hurt. And, and you have the propensity, you know, to want to respond to the comments all the time. But then you start to, to look back and, you know, you know how people say you can't debate facts. There are facts about my life. And I, and I, I think I, I speak to myself as if there are facts that I will push forward through this. I will be great. I will inspire others. I will um, help us achieve a certain level of equity and justice. So what if you're wasting your time talking about me in a negative light um to me it shows that you are you, you have something you have some 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 self-confidence issues and you might be pretty miserable and that's unfortunate i've had people send me hate uh hate mail after i posted a video of myself being targeted um i've had people try to get me fired from my job um but again i know what i'm again it lets me know what i'm doing is the right thing and the last thing i'll say too is I know what Dr. King went through. I know what Rosa Parks, I know what Malcolm X went through. I know the letters they received. So I look at that stuff and I'm like, okay, you're going to send me a message on Facebook. That's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think I, I love that perspective and, and I just, I appreciate what you're saying. And I, and I just, I reflect on, I, I don't know if I could put up with that all the time because I, I can just imagine how, it's so draining because it's just, it's you, it's a part of who you are. You, you can't and shouldn't change that. And so for those of us, like, and I'm speaking on behalf of, you know, for other white educators who are out there, how can we become better allies and become more, more a part of the change in helping eliminate so much of this ignorance? Another great question. I think you already said something when we started and it's about reading books, uh, reading books from black authors who give their genuine perspective, reading books from white authors who are out there in a battlefield fighting. Um, then there's a lady named Jacqueline Battle Lord that I'm familiar with in Chicago who does a lot of work like that. Uh, right. People like Tim Wise, uh, Jane Elliott, just reading about them, but then also understanding um, that you have a role to play in, and that's like talking to black colleagues or talking mm -hmm. to your friends and and, and making sure it's not just a surface conversation, not, you know, hey, how you doing? That, that's fine. How's your favorite sports team? That's cool, too. But, you know, really, um, you know, if, if we were at work right now, honestly, like the situation with the mod Arbery, uh, there's another situation mm -hmm. with Breonna Taylor. Those yes. are things that we can't help but to know about. Um, and I know it's, it's uncomfortable for some people to even bring this up in a conversation without it feeling too contrived or forced. But those are things that we, we talk about. And if you're a teacher, it's a little easier to just say, look, we're going to talk about this today because there's a connection to mm -hmm. our, our content, you know, for this moment. But I think just um, letting kids know that you're concerned. You know, for me, I, I look at it in terms of I know it's not the same level, but I'm a man, you know, and, and my wife is a, is a black woman. So she deals with being a black person in a society and a woman in, in a society. So I have to always think from the perspective of, well, what and what benefit do I get from not being uh, viewed, you know, viewed as a woman in this perspective for whatever reason. So um, it, it just it's, it's constantly checking yourself and understanding that we're born into a society where we're taught to be biased and prejudiced, but we just don't have to act on it. So begin yeah. to check yourself and say, why do I think this? You know, and just keep asking questions and searching. YouTube is powerful. Google is powerful, too. Well, and, and I, I what you said, I just I just I, I want to like cut that part out of this whole conversation, just blast it everywhere, because I think it was so well worded in so many different layers and aspects of that. And I, and I completely agree with you, like all of us are born into bias 
and, and our own, but, but we don't have to allow that to control ourselves. And it's just about education and it's about understanding and, and seeing where people come from and, and learning and growing and, and not taking everything so personal, but getting out there and asking questions and being part of that conversation. And so that's why I love the work you're doing because I think it's so important for our world. And, you know, you mentioned at the top of the show as well that you recently became an author, which is a yeah. huge accomplishment. So what is the title of your book and, and how did that come to be? Let me see if I can. Yeah, there we go. You can see it a little bit over there. Ah, there <laughs> so, we go. We're going to shift. So uh, the title of my book is Black History Saved My Life, How My Viral Hate Crime Led to an Awakening. So, you know, I guess, again, one of the reasons why I can't let up on this journey it's because when you keep getting a constant reminder about something, you, you, you have to do it. You have to fight. You know, again, talking about Jordan, the Pistons beat him up, but he knew he had this purpose to bring championships to the city, so he kept fighting. So um, in 2016, my wife and I, we're both teachers, went to an event in Chicago, and um, we were actually uh, targeted by this lady because we, they were playing uh, cornhole, beanbag game, and they threw it very far. We went to grab it about five minutes later because no one went to get it from their um, – from their group it was about four of them two of us and uh as, as soon as we grabbed it she ran up to us started calling us the n-word and like my and i began to record because i'm just thinking yeah. how absurd this is and it's not a crime to, to say those words you know no matter how harmful or hurtful they are so she knocked the phone out of my hand and then she gets so frustrated towards the end that she spits on me and my wife primarily my wife and we eventually leave she gets kicked out or whatever we don't get any of her information from the cops which really made us mad and we're sitting in the car and I look at my phone. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got I got the, I got all the footage on my phone. I can't believe this. So before we leave, because we're like we live about 45 minutes from Chicago, I put it together, put it online. I said, we need her information. Please help us. And uh, the the support we got was amazing. It was just uh, black, white, Hispanic. Everybody was like, yo, I know her. Went to high school with her. She uh, was like this in high school. I would, would gladly, you know, I would love to see something, get see you get justice because of the, the bad energy she yeah. put out into the world. So from then on, it became, um, after everything died down, it, it's me, right? It's me and my thoughts because I live this stuff. So I'm like, I have to make sure I get justice for my family. And it was some tough days. And in the midst of trying to get her arrested and then waiting for trial, which took like uh, 13, 14 months for the trial to start, mm -hmm. I began writing because I had a, a day where I just broke down on the way to work. And it was just so much on me just, you know, working at the school and being a minority at the school already and um, feeling like you're alone on the island and, and not ever in my life feeling the need to seek out mental health support or therapy. I took off work because I broke down. I went home and I said, look, I don't even know how to use my health insurance for to see a, a therapist so i just started writing and then it became make an outline and i started to look at my life and i'm like man i dealt with racism a lot in my life and i don't think black folks realize how much we deal with not everybody deals with the explicit form like i do but it's just the implicit forms too because gr growing up in a red line community which people call a ghetto these things were created by policy uh strategically and explicitly for a reason so i began to navigate through these things and i tell my story about how i traversed through it and then the historical lesson that led to me being at this place in history and that all leads up to that hate crime which was like a huge thing in 2016 2017 so it's a reflection piece and i think people will understand if you're black or you're excuse me a person of color you'll understand how uh, how to better talk to your kids about this and if you're an ally i believe you'll understand why it's important to understand our journeys because I firmly believe that there's been a big gap between like after the 70s up until like the Black Lives Matter movement, we don't really talk too much about the struggles that were going on. You know, there was a Rodney King incident splattered in there, there was Barack Obama, but we didn't really discuss. People were still struggling and, I, and my book shows that and also too how you can persevere through that. You know, there's so much that you shared there that I think is important for people to hear. And I, I know that I'm, I'm already going to order this as soon as we're done talking because I, I just I'm so in, in, inspired by you and your story. And I, I but I'm reminded of the fact that we live in a day and age and that what the story you just shared is an example where we have the benefit of video to prove what's happening we think about you know the armory case that's going on now and 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 all of that like if the video wouldn't have existed 
where would society have fallen and what their beliefs are. And when you look back at our history and so many things that have taken place, it's like how many of those decisions were incorrectly made because there was no video to back up people of color when they speak out against things and, and the oppression that's been put upon them. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you had the wherewithal to have that so that you could have that additional protection yourself. And I'm glad that you used this, this experience to write about it so that you could inspire others. And so, you know, getting out there, sharing your story, publishing this out there, what has been something really positive that you've seen come from this? Oh man, there, there are a lot of things because first and foremost, Prior to that uh, that incident, I was just a, a classroom teacher. I was a classroom mm -hmm. teacher. I did a mentoring program at my school for males. Um, I would bring in speakers every now and then. I was, of course, very concerned about issues still, but I still kept it for the classroom. Um, I, we did some community events, my wife and I, but it was still I'm not the I'm not the spokesperson. I love kids. I love teaching, but I'm just I'm not a speaker or anything. But when that incident happened, I was like, okay. I feel my wife told me before that I could do that. I could be on the stage. I could do. I didn't. I didn't believe it, but right. I said now that was one of those incidents. And I'm not in any way trying to compare this to people who have been targets of police brutality. But it was an incident where this lady was calling over a cop too in the midst of everything, and I was kind of feeling my life flash like, oh my god, like mm -hmm. this is really happening to me. So if I can go through that and make it out on the other side, and people see one of my worst moments ever. Um, I'm like, I, I got to be fearless. So a few months after that, I started to uh, I had some friends who worked at libraries and different schools and they wanted me to share my story with kids. And I've been speaking ever since. And that's one of the most powerful things for me because I'm showing kids that you can use this, you know, this use this ne perceived negativity to be something powerful to inspire others. And I want people to not be ashamed of their pain because your pain to me serves a purpose and it can inspire so many other people. So from then on, I, I start speaking. Um, my colleague and I, we started a black student union at our school to support our kids. And we find out about their stories again, like, like you said, no cameras when they're at work being called derogatory names or whatever. So we began to support them and, and just celebrate black culture in a positive way. Um, and then, of course, the book just gives me something else because it is, it is again, it's, to me, it's a timestamp again for people to know this is what happened. This is the era of of of, of social media racism of of uh, trending topic racism and i want people to see that and when it's all said and done i i know that my mark would be letting people know that we go through a lot in this country as black americans we go through a lot as americans period but our power lies in our ability to triumph and, and use our pain to uh, serve others for the better that's that's incredible you are very well spoken and and i i just I, I admire what you're doing so much and you know ernest i could sit here and talk to you for like another hour but m my last question i'm going to ask right now is just that you know i believe as people there are so many things that we hold so firm to our beliefs and who we are and what we what we have deep within us and so for everybody listening or watching today if they were to walk away with one thing what would your one thing for them be um ooh, that's a good question man I'm such a, you could tell, I like to elaborate. So to pick one thing, <laughs> but I'll say this because I'm preparing a message next week and it's kind of on this theme. Um, change, so things don't happen to you, they happen for you. If you live to see another day, it's for a reason. So I love yeah. that. Well, Ernest, I, I got emotional several times during our talk today, just, just reflecting on not just so many things going on right now and mm -hmm. i appreciate you and your voice and the work that you're doing and i just encourage you to get out there and continue sharing your message because i know you are impacting countless lives adults and children alike just by sharing your story and so i am so grateful that you shared a couple minutes today to kind of share that with my audience as well so thank you thank you todd i appreciate your time thanks for having me and and thank you, everybody else, for listening or watching another episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you get your stuff, it's there. I hope today's conversation with Ernest has encouraged you to get out there and tell your story because every story matters.